All right, um, so I'd like to introduce uh, our first talk session of the day. So the way all of uh, the talk sessions today will work is that we'll have three speakers. Uh, they're each gonna have about 15 minutes or so to speak to you. Uh, and then we'll save most of the questions until the end of the session. So we'll have a few minutes for clarifying questions or something that you've just got to know um, at the end of their talks. But then we'll ask you to save your bigger discussion points for the end of the session when we'll ask all three speakers to come up here to our bar stools uh, and join us uh, for a Q&A uh, together. So uh, with that said, I'd like to bring up our first speaker. Uh, and let me get her slides up. All right, uh, so I'd like to introduce Lisa Federer, the Data Science and Open Science Librarian uh, at the National Library of Medicine. Lisa. Thank you, um, and thank you so much for the organizers uh, for having me. I'm really excited to be with you this morning. Uh, so today I wanna to talk a little bit about data sharing and reuse at the National Institutes of Health, uh, some of the initiatives that we have going on, and then talk a little bit about my own research into metrics uh, for data reuse. A little bit of contextualizing information if you're not familiar with the National Institutes of Health. We are the primary biomedical and public health research institution in the United States. We are the National Institutes plural because we are comprised of 27 institutes and centers that focus on various different aspects of human health and research. Uh, we do send out most of our funding to our extramural research programs out to institutions uh, that you are probably all coming from. And we also have an intramural research program uh, at the NIH, primarily on our main campus in Bethesda and some other locations with nearly 6,000 scientists um, working on various issues. The National Library of Medicine that I come from is one of the institutes of the NIH, and we are also the world's largest biomedical library. We do things that you would probably think of a library doing. We collect books and journal articles, but we're also a major resource for data. Uh, we house the National Center for Biotechnology Information, which has a number of different data repositories, and we are sending out over 115 terabytes of data per day to over 5 million users worldwide. And we're also bringing in quite a lot of data every day, um, over 15 terabytes per day from around 3,000 users around the world. As a library, we have it as our mission to make open science and scholarship more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, or FAIR. And we're also interested in making sure that digital research objects are attributable and sustainable. People can cite them um, and give credit to the people who created it, and also that we have good systems for sustaining access to these resources. The NIH, on the whole, has a long history of dedication to data sharing. Our mission is to, oh, my slide got cut off there a little bit, uh, to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, length, and life, and reduce illness and disability. And data sharing is really foundational to that. So uh, we have some formal policies, but really the, the sort of longstanding philosophy is that the results and accomplishments of the activities that we fund should be made available to the research community and to the public at large. We have a number of different data sharing policies that have been in place uh, since about 2003. And breaking news, uh, just yesterday, the um, draft plan for uh, data management and sharing plan policies went out for public comment. So I will tweet out that link to the conference hashtag uh, when I get done talking. Um, that will be open until January 10th for public comment. So I really encourage all of you to um, give it a look, make some comments, take it back to your communities. So in addition to the policy piece, we've also uh, supported a number of different infrastructure projects related to making data open and available. One of the first was the Human Genome Project, uh, which you know, we made that data publicly available. And since then, we've followed along with a number of, and these are just a, a small sampling of the many different uh, repositories and data resources that we support and house at the NIH. We also have a, oh good, it's not cut off on that screen, only on my screen. <laughs> we also have um, an NIH strategic plan for data science that uh, we began last year. This was requested by Congress and we actually do report back quarterly to Congress. 
um, on these various different activities that we're undertaking to enhance data sharing access and interoperability. So these uh, different initiatives fall under these five broad categories. And you can see that these really span um, the range of different uh, sort of things that we need to think about in order to make data uh, and science generally more open and more accessible. Also within uh, the National Library of Medicine strategic plan, data science and open science is a major focus for us. Um, our activities fall into three broad goal areas, including uh, infrastructure and developing uh, that for information and for data, the user experience of getting data and information to people when they need it in the form that they need it, and also developing the workforce and, and providing education to the public and other uh, people of interest to make sure that we are prepared to use that data that we have available to us. So this has been just a little snippet of the many activities that are going on at the NIH and the NLM to help ensure uh, open science as we go forward. Uh, policy and implementation is a big part of that. Citation and incent yeah, incentivization is something that we're also looking at, um, at scale curation and how we coordinate and partner with other funders and organizations to ensure that not just data, but all of the uh, research outputs are as fair as possible, as well as attributable and sustainable. So, you know, we have a lot of things going on to make sure that people can get access to data and other research products, but what are the impacts of doing that? Once we have all of this data available, what's actually happening to all of that? And that is where my research focuses. So I'm interested in figuring out who's reusing this data that we make available. What are the topics of data sets that are most reused so we can potentially focus our curation and, and preservation efforts on those highly reused data sets? When in a data set's life cycle is it reused? Do uh, reuse patterns of data sets look similar to potentially uh, what we see in uh, patterns over time for citations to articles, or is there something different going on? Where in the world are these data sets being reused? And why are researchers reusing data? What are the, the things that they're actually doing with them in their projects? So it's really difficult right now to track what happens to data that has been made publicly available because we don't really have great infrastructure for doing that. We have good technical infrastructure for knowing when I put an article out there who has cited that, we don't have that yet uh, for data sets, although that is something that many different um, scholarly communications communities are working on. So in the absence of a good way to reliably track uh, where data sets are being cited, in my research, I used data requests uh, as a proxy for reuse. So looking at three different repositories that have um, sensitive human data, so you can't just download and, and use it. You have to put in a request actually stating what you plan to do with it. You even have to have IRB approval from your own institution. So because of the fact that these are, it's a pretty robust process to uh, apply for and get this data, I think that this is a somewhat useful proxy for reuse. So uh, the three repositories that I looked at, uh, one genomic, the database of genotypes and phenotypes, which is housed within uh, NCBI at NLM, and then two clinical repositories, uh, one for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the other for the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Altogether, uh, these include several thousand data sets that have been requested um, over 100,000 times. So looking at this, I was able to find some patterns in what is going on in terms of reuse. So one of the things that I found, and this is part of a much larger study, so I'm just gonna hit on a couple highlights here, is that genomic and clinical data sets are reused in different ways. Genomic data sets in this study were more often used in meta-analysis, so getting multiple different data sets and putting them together for a new study, whereas the clinical data sets were more often used in the context of an original research project, so getting a single data set and using it to ask a research question. This makes sense if you think about the sort of way that these different data sets or data types work. Genomic data, for one thing, you need a larger sample size uh, to get meaningful statistical um, observations from that. And genomic data is also much more standardized, generally speaking, than clinical data. So it's feasible to uh, merge multiple data sets for analysis in a genomic context more often than that is the case in a clinical context. 
I was also really interested in looking at quantifying the similarity between data set topics, uh, what the topic was that the data set was originally collected for, and the context in which it was reused. One of the concerns that researchers often cite for not wanting to share their data is that they're worried that they might get scooped. They put their data out there and somebody uh, gets it and finds the great discovery that the original collector would have made and they don't get credit for it. Um, so my question was, is that really the case? Are people getting data sets and using them for the exact same reason as they were originally collected? And to quantify this, I used a method called semantic similarity. So the data sets were all described with medical subject heading terms, um, and I used the uh, NLM medical text indexer to apply those same terms to the requests. So I could figure out what are the topics of the requests, what are the topics of the data sets, and how similar are those. Because uh, the mesh uh, ontology is in this sort of tree form, we can quantify the similarity between two terms. So suppose that we have a data set that is described as being about heart diseases, and the uh, reuse request is also about heart diseases. Those would have a semantic similarity score of one, exact same topic. On the other hand, if the reuse request was about something like informatics, that's on a completely different branch of the mesh tree, so that score is zero, they're nothing alike. And then in between, uh, things could be more or less similar depending on sort of where they fall on the mesh tree and, and so therefore how conceptually similar they are. So what we see when we look at this is that, again, there are differences in the ways that clinical data sets are used versus genomic data sets. Um, so on the left here, uh, items that would score zero, they're nothing alike. On the right, items that scored one, they're exactly the same topic uh, as the reason for which the data set was originally collected. Um, so in addition to these being somewhat different between clinical and genomic research, what I think is also interesting here is that a not insignificant number of these have a semantic similarity score of zero. People are using these data sets for an entirely novel topic, um, completely different from what the original data set was intended for. And we also see a pretty broad spread, particularly in the genomic uh, reuse of these different topics. So while there are quite a few particularly in the clinical data sets that do have a semantic similarity score of, uh, of one, they're identical topics, that's not the case for everything. Um, so we're not seeing people just taking data sets and reusing them for the exact same thing. Looking at where data sets are reused around the world, uh, we do see that these data sets are going out to uh, many different countries, but they are uh, primarily being used in the US, kind of makes sense, these are US-based US repositories, and we also see that um, the most overrepresented countries are almost all English-speaking nations. So Canada, the US, of course, Australia, the UK. Um, this, again, probably makes a little bit of sense. Uh, you have to submit a request in English. All the documentation is in English. Of course, many people outside of English-speaking nations also can speak English. Um, but I think it kind of makes sense a little bit that um, that, that is the case here. In terms of the temporal uh, pattern of uh, reuse, what I find really interesting here is that uh, early requests to data sets are highly predictive of later reuse. So uh, what you see this top line is data sets that are in the 90th percentile of all requests. Those are already way, way more requested in the first year of their life than uh, data sets that are in lower percentiles of requests. I also did a regression analysis on this and even controlling for the age of the data set, about 75% of the variability in how many requests a data set gets over the long term can be predicted by looking at first, first year requests only. So um, this I think is useful information to know that those things that are already highly requested in the first year are going to likely go on to be highly requested over time. A uh, topic of the data set is also predictive of reuse. I won't get deeply into the method that I used here, but I did topic modeling to identify clusters of data sets that are similar. Um, and what we see here is uh, the dotted line shows basically um, the number of requests related to the number of data sets that have that topic. So anything that is above the dotted line is over-requested based on uh, 
its representation within the repository as a whole, anything below it uh, under requested based on its representation. And what we see here is things like blood and cardiovascular diseases um, are much more requested than less common things like congenital disorders, rare inherited diseases. So this suggests that the more common the disease, the more likely someone is to request it, which kind of makes sense. So this has been just a small sliver of a much larger study, but um, a couple sort of takeaways that I want to mention here. Uh, one is that researchers are reusing data, uh, so there is actual, you know, use of this. Uh, improved documentation potentially uh, in non-English languages could potentially increase reuse generally and also in under-resourced countries where we're not seeing data reused as much. Uh, increased interoperability of data appears to be associated with higher reuse across a broader range of topics as we see in that genomic data. And curation and preservation decisions could potentially be based on early interest in a data set. Because those first year requests are, are so predictive of overall requests, we could make some pretty um, evidence-based decisions about which data sets we want to focus on for curation. So I'll end there and just want to acknowledge my colleagues in the Office of Strategic Initiatives at the NLM. And I think there's a couple minutes for questions. Thank you. Uh, any any quick questions for Lisa? Yeah. Oh. Jake. Lisa, I like your, your study that talks about how uh, data that is highly requested also has a higher Oh, we're going to bring you on mic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks again, Lisa. So uh, my question is, you, you had a slide talking about data that's highly requested is also highly reused. I found that really interesting from, say, an alternative metric or, or um, attention gathering for the data. Does the NIH uh, repositories that you mentioned, do they, do they showcase the amount of requests the data has received? Is that information available to users to see that information? Or is that hidden um, internally with the repository? It depends on the repository. So um, the dbGaP data, for example, I just got all of that from their website. You can go on their website and get their requests. Um, the other two, I did get those directly from the repository. So it kind of depends. We have many, many repositories at the NIH, so they're not all doing the same thing. But um, yeah, I think definitely um, the data sets that are already getting a lot of attention, people are probably more likely to pay attention to them. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think would be interesting going forward, not just for NIH repositories, but for all repositories, is having that info available for people. Great. Thank you. All right, I'd like to introduce our second speaker for the session, uh, Alexander Mathis. He's currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard and co-developer of Deep Lab Cut. Uh, and in 2020, he'll be starting his own lab group at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. Alex? Well, thanks for inviting me. It's really great to be here and to talk about a software package that we have been developing over the last one and a half year. and that is already widely used and has been great fun. So I think there will be, I think in this forum, it's also a great forum to talk about this software package because I think there will be two aspects where you'll see how open science was really important in influencing this project and how it then also ch changed kind of what others could do based on it. So the general problem that Deep Lab Cut is trying to deal with is the analysis of behavior. You all know that humans have always been interested in studying behavior. And historically, that has been very difficult, of course, because there were no high-speed cameras, there were no things like this. And this is, for example, the first high-speed recording of gait. And that was it allowed us to answer scientific questions like, do horses ever have all the four gates off the ground? Now, what is interesting about the analysis of behavior, for example, in contrast to many other things that we want to analyze, is, is that actually computer vision is extremely hard. Namely, if you want to teach a computer here to detect the uh, hooves, and tell what the gate is, then that's a very, very challenging problem. And of course, a lot of different approaches have been used in the past, like model-based fitting here from a famous paper by Marr and also other approaches. But for a long time, 
kind of marker-based tracking. So the idea of putting markers at the relevant points of the body of an animal was kind of the gold standard in order to do, for example, locomotion analysis. And there are, of course, many problems with putting markers on animals or humans. Namely, it changes kind of the behavior in some sense. After the fact, you cannot look at other body parts and how they move in a study, but you, because you already picked kind of the points that you record from. So these are all issues with these methods. And, um, and so one thing that was amazing was actually in the last five years, roughly, deep learning has changed marker-based tracking and what has become possible. And I want to highlight this by showing a video of a very famous algorithm that was actually developed here at uh, CMU called OpenPost. As you can imagine, it's an open science algorithm. And what you see here is a bunch of humans dancing in Sydney, and this algorithm is being applied to the scene. The algorithm has not been trained on that scene. The algorithm just detects all the different body parts of all these dancers in this very complicated scene. And this is really remarkable performance when you, when you think about it. And so um, here I kind of want to briefly highlight the history of deep learning for human pose estimation. So I think the first paper on this topic came out in 2014 and then relatively quickly the performance of these algorithms got extremely good until deeper cut for example in open pose came out in 2017 and there were really a full flurry of papers like 4,000 papers on this topic um, were um, published and very quickly and the thing that is interesting about this, so one thing that I think made the advance of this field so quick is essentially that these people, they compete on benchmarks, that's in computer vision I'm saying, and they all share the code essentially. So they build very, very quickly on top of each other and then achieve such astonishing results. Now very briefly, how do these algorithms work? Essentially they take in the image and then there's a predictor that predicts the pose of the human, which is just the X and Y co uh, coordinates of all the different body parts. And then the trick here is essentially that this predictor now is a deep neural net, so it's very, very deep, has many stacked layers, and it's trained on a lot of data in order to predict kind of these body parts. But then in comparison to previous methods for pose estimation, there are a number of extremely appealing properties why these are useful for other fields. Namely, they work in the wild, as you can see. Like, you can do this pretty much on any situation. I think this is in rehearse mode, so it goes at a different timing. Um, yeah, um, so they work in the wild, they're extremely robust in contrast to other computer vision algorithms, they are, they're relatively fast, they require no body model. So you, whatever you annotate, the algorithm will learn to basically predict where the body parts are in principle, and they require no manual tuning. And so that was something where we, so I'm actually a neuroscientist, and we are interested in studying the behavior of animals. So we wanted to, so we need algorithms like this to measure the behavior of animals. And so one of our major insights in our paper that came out last year was essentially that we showed that you can detect body parts like here, this is the snout of a, of a mouse, and the ears, for example, you see 10 pixels. You can predict the position of the snout with, let's say, less than 10 pixel accuracy if you only annotate 50 frames, which is, takes you maybe 15 minutes to click on 15, uh, 50 snouts. And then you can predict the accuracy of that body part with that precision on like days of recordings of, of behavior. So what we also showed in that paper is that that's not just a feature of, of snouts of mice, but you can in fact use this for many different um, behaviors. This is a reaching paradigm in mice where a mouse is reaching for a joystick. And this also had just 140 frames annotated. And so now this ease of annotating very little data and getting remarkable feature detectors was something that um, I think had a lot of people use the code very quickly. And there were really a lot of interesting applications. I think also going back to the introduction of this session, I think what is very interesting is uh, old videos can of course be reused and reanalyzed with these new algorithms very quickly. That's a matter of 20 minutes. Um, we also got connected, uh, contacted, for example, by Amir Patel, who studies cheetahs, which is a wonderful thing to study and, and it works well in this context as, as well. Um, so now, specifically, what is interesting about this type of software and what some people have called call it kind of software 2.0, in contrast to other software where you kind of program, let's say, 
how the algorithm should detect where particular body parts are. Here, the, the software programs itself in some sense. And so the specific needs that one then has is that, um, that at first, there are a lot of things popping up here. Um, security, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> it's not my computer. Um, <laughs> um, so, so the user first kind of, let's say, if you're interested in tracking multiple body parts of the hand here, of, of a mouse, then the user can create a project, can extract different frames where the hand is in different postures, can annotate these different body parts, and then select a particular um, select a particular network, train this deep neural network on uh, this data. So in order to predict from the image these body part locations, and then um, perhaps if it doesn't work too well, one can kind of refine and add more annotated examples to the to the stack and retrain or yes train again. And then once um, the network is trained, then you can of course use it for inference on lots of other videos and it works relatively well. This is of course a simplified workflow of kind of how Deep Lab Cut works, where you kind of have a tight integration of the annotation data, the refinement of annotation data, the neural networks that kind of operate on that data and so on and so forth. Here is a more elaborate scheme that shows kind of um, canonically the path would be you create a project and you go down to analyze your data, but let's say if you over the long term, expand your project a lot and include differently looking mice, then you can kind of go along this uh, loop path and include additional annotated frames to, um, to make the performance good enough. And so Deep Lab Cut is an open source package that is built on a lot of open source packages. That's really something that one, one should highlight here. And that we have also made sure that it actually runs across a lot of platforms. And I think that's also something that has come up in earlier talks. Um, I think it's, it's really important that software can be kind of used in the cloud, can be used on Docker containers that are extremely shareable, um, and also local university clusters and so on and so forth. And even the same project, as you will see in a second, can be kind of run on different platforms and projects can be shared and the weights can be shared. Um, and then another type of integration that we have for Deep Lab, that it's integrated with a lot of other packages for kind of logging results, for mining results, for then doing later behavioral analysis on top of all these pose estimation um, data. And on this next slide, I kind of dig into some of the features, namely Periodically, we kind of update the code and put it on, on what, the latest version on GitHub. And we see that there's a lot of chat there and there are quite a few contributions that people have made to the code, especially for kind of, most of the contributions are kind of contributing to making it work broadly across lots of platforms uh, because we mostly work on Linux. So that's actually quite a challenge to get stuff work also equally well on all the other systems. Um, but there have been a lot of downloads. There have been a lot of forks meaning potential contributors that actually take this open source code and flexibly change something in order to adjust it to their specific project. And then as I said, I think for the user experience, what, what is quite important is that projects can be shared, both with respect to annotation data, but also with respect to the weights. So if you have a very good network that can detect the hands of a mouse, and you can share this with your colleagues and then they can do the same very quickly, which really contributes to kind of reproducibility of research because you know that someone will actually analyze the same body parts in the same location relatively and so on and so forth. We also made sure um, that there's a simple workflow. We'll go into this a bit later and that there are actually multiple ways to interact with the codes depending on kind of the background of the users, namely the kind of more programming terminal interfaces, and then of course a graphical interface that I will actually highlight in the next slide. Um, and then I think what is also important for a project like this to have to help people kind of get this off the ground is to have example projects that are fully worked where they can kind of play around in the cloud actually, they don't need to install anything and see how it works on, let's say our data that is already annotated. Um, and so here you have an example video of the GUI of Deep Lab Cut. 
where a project is being started. Um, and so here is just some metadata that you put in and then the GUI comes up so you can adjust the body parts to the ones, let's say, that you care about. Um, you can zoom in, make highly accurate adjustments. Then in the next step, you create a training set where you split the data into two parts. You um, can pick different neural networks, you train it, and so on and so forth. And I think one thing that I felt was that we realized was extremely important. Many of many of our users are extremely uh, experienced programmers, but some of them maybe are not. And I think one thing that like deep learning software has been really amazing, but uh, having been able to kind of bring this into the hands of people that maybe are not even able to program that well, I think was something that is very important. And I think for us, what really made this possible was kind of to make sure that we write a very clear cut protocol that has like, okay, here are seven minimal steps. If you do this, it will should work on your data roughly. And as you can see kind of in the amount of downloads that this this user guide has received, that's really something that I think was useful for a lot of people. Um, then we are also very fortunate to be on the community, uh, we're a community partner of the image forum where people discuss problems that they have or kind of challenges. And as I said, the code is on GitHub and there are quite a few contributors external. And then of course there are lots of contributors internally to the package in the updates. Um, that's the forum, then there will be Twitter. Another thing that we made good experience with was to have training workshops and in the future we'll also have hackathons on the software. So this is actually a picture from a training workshop where I was invited by students to Warsaw to talk on this, about the software. And I think that's also, especially for developers, something very useful because you get a direct contact with, with people that use this or want to use this and you figure out kind of what is maybe not working, what is not intuitive and how you can then kind of optimize your software. And I think uh, one thing that I find greatly enjoyable is our Twitter feed because people share their results um, and what they work on. And there are some really interesting applications. Like for example, I would have never thought that someone would use this. So this works also well for tendon tracking as an example. I don't know. I think this doesn't really work. No. Um, okay, so with this, I would come to an end and thank uh, the other co-developer, Mackenzie Mathis. So also moving to EPFL. And then a lot of people have been involved, Matthias Bethke, Tanmi Nath is a postdoc in McKenzie's lab, and then a number of students, Tom and Mert, and so on. And of course, I want to also thank my postdoc supervisors at Harvard, Venki um, and Matthias Bethke, and lots of collaborators that made sure that this is an exciting project for their data. While you've been developing this and doing these hackathons, what have you learned about making it possible for someone to get under the hood and repurpose your work in ways that you didn't intend while still making it easy for someone who doesn't have a programming background to, to have success with it? Um, yeah, I think, so, so the whole software package is like open source Python package. And I think on the one hand, there, so there are a lot of functions that there's kind of, I would say almost two types of APIs that the software has. One that really goes very strictly with kind of this nature protocols. Okay, here are n steps and you will get your result and it will even plot it and so on. And then I think there's actually, there are many, many more functions that are differently kind of uh, documented and that people dig into or can add functions and, and tweak it. Um, hackathons we actually have not done yet. We will have one next year, so I'm very much looking forward to that and to kind of really um, interact more with experienced users and also developers of other packages so that there will be a tighter integration between 
packages uh, that do like neural data analysis on top of, let's say, behavioral analysis, things like that. <coughs> Is this being used for any clinical applications and are people accepting this in clinical fields? Are, are people? Using this for clinical applications? Yeah, so there are quite a few, uh, there are quite a few labs that use this uh, in clinical application for like analysis of stroke, um, like behavior post-stroke or tremors and things like this. The license is fully open source and free. It's free, free to use. Um, and, and so it, it allows these type of, um, of analysis methods. I think another thing that is actually quite interesting is that let's say once you train the algorithm on human data of pose estimation data, then when cannot, if you don't share the annotation data itself, one can actually not reproduce the data that went into the algorithm. So that's also something that is actually good for privacy of, of, of patients. Do you find the clinicians are accepting uh, well, so I personally, I don't work with any clinicians on this, but I know that there are quite a few um, labs that use it with clinicians, both at Harvard and many other hospitals, actually. Um, yeah. Um, my question is, are you planning to extend this in kind of like a transfer learning framework? So you can imagine a lot of behaviors would probably be very similar or on the same organism. So would it be possible for somebody to take a model trained on something very similar and use that as initialization per se? Yes. So that's actually something we're doing very actively. So we will have a, a model zoo where you can, for certain paradigms in neuroscience that are extremely common, like a mouse running in a box or a mouse reaching, um, you can basically just download weights that will be trained on data from many different labs and therefore actually fairly robust and should will work in many contexts and otherwise you can just retrain with a few frames. So that's certainly something uh, that we are doing and that will also be released soon. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'd like to introduce our third speaker in the session, uh, Casey Green, who's an associate professor at the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, the Integrative Genomics Lab, also the director of the Childhood Cancer Data Lab, and uh, of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. I realize I should have been reading you the titles of the talks as well. <laughs> He'll be talking about machine learning for rare diseases and the role of open data. Casey. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, it's fun to be here to share a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing. I was asked to share in particular some of the stuff that we're doing in the Childhood Cancer Data Lab. So I'll just give you a little bit of an idea of what that is. Um, so just to give you an introduction, I think the easiest way to explain what the Childhood Cancer Data Lab is, is that sort of I and the rest of the team uh, work on a data science team that was ascent that essentially began with a four-year-old girl. So this is a picture of, of Alex, and Alex was uh, diagnosed with neuroblastoma at the age of one. Uh, when she was four, she enrolled in a clinical trial and she told her parents, okay, when, this, when I'm done being in the hospital, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna start a lemonade stand and I'm gonna raise money for pediatric cancer research. Her parents were willing to say yes to whatever she asked for at that point because she didn't have a, a very good prognosis at the time. Um, she did end up going home, raising money through a lemonade stand. She ended up raising uh, $2,000 at the first lemonade stand. By the time she died at the age of eight, she had raised a million dollars for pediatric cancer research. Um, and then her parents uh, took her dream and continued on with it. So the lemonade stand that she started became a nonprofit foundation, which is now called Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. Uh, it's now raised more than $150 million for research and funded more than 1,000 projects at 135 different institutions. So this is sort of the story when we got involved with Alex's about two years ago. Um, and what they had identified was there was a gap in the field in that people were having, there were large data resources that were becoming available, but it was very hard for people to take those data resources and make discoveries with them. So two years ago, they founded something called the Childhood Cancer Data Lab, which I uh, am helping them to launch. <laughs> so the, the Childhood Cancer Data Lab's mission is to empower pediatric cancer researchers who are poised for the next big discovery with knowledge, data, and tools. 
So in the, term, in, in the sense of knowledge, uh, we run workshops. Um, so Hua Chin actually came to one of the workshops that we offered uh, last month and will be delivering uh, the same uh, information and instructional materials here as we're trying to figure out how to scale those by having materials offered at additional campuses that aren't just ours. Um, data, so we try to build data resources um, that I won't talk about too much. And then one thing I will talk about here is sort of tools and how open data really powers a lot of the things that we're doing in the Childhood Cancer Data Lab. So this is a gap that we identified early on. So we hired a user experience designer as one of our first uh, hires. And what they found was that people are pretty good now at analyzing their own data. Where they struggle is if they need to connect their data to other people's data, or if they need to connect multiple data sets together. And particularly, this is challenging if there are multiple tissues or they have to find commonalities between disease models and tissue samples. <laughs> um, and in particular, uh, there, the gap they were addressing is if you I, analyze multiple data sets and you find uh, a certain disease module in one data set, what you really want to know is in this other data set, is this the same module? And that analysis is very... <laughs> Sorry, I have daycare long as well. Uh, <laughs> very consuming of time and attention. So it takes a really well-trained analyst about a year or two to actually align multiple data sets and try to understand if the same processes are at play in those. And so what we identified, so working with someone who's, a, so Jacqueline Taroni, Dr. Taroni is the principal data scientist on the Childhood Cancer Data Lab team. What we sat down and thought about was, wouldn't it be great for these rare disease data sets if there was this reusable module library you could take these modules and look in individual data sets and see if that module was present in data set X, data set Y, and data set Z. And because you'd be reusing these modules, you'd know it was sort of the same module. And uh, so this all sounds wonderful, well, and good. Since I'm here, uh, you know, we're using machine learning. I have good and bad news. Uh, we've had good experience, but it's, you know, it's good to remember that we want to think of machine learning sometimes as a panacea to all of our problems. Uh, we have not generally found that to be the case. We think that sort of you often have to design a unique approach to, to each individual problem. And in some cases, it's just very hard to, to use it effectively. In this case, you know, we knew we'd be facing a bit of a challenge in that machine learning approaches tend to benefit, uh, tend to do really well if you have large numbers of examples. So if you think of this as your data matrix, what you'd really like is a data matrix that's sort of very long and not very wide. And what I mean there is, you know, some things so in this case, a modest number of sort of highly relevant things, but you know them about many, many people. So you, know, you might know 30 things, but you might know 30 things about 30,000 people. This is a case where you can really build very accurate models. Rare diseases, so pediatric cancers, though they're collectively deadly, are individually rare diseases. The challenge we have in this setting is that even though we can profile the genome and we can do these genome-wide assays, we can now know many, many things. So we could measure the, the expression levels of 25,000 genes in the human genome. But we're only ever going to measure the expression levels in a modest number of kids. Because even though uh, pediatric cancers are the largest killer by disease of kids under the age of 18, in, there are many different cancers. And individually, each one is rare. So we're only ever going to know that about a small number of people. And so what Jackie developed was an approach where we make machine learning models that aren't just designed for one pediatric cancer, one biological context, they're designed for many biological contexts. And this is where the data reuse comes in. So her hypothesis was that the meaningful patterns that we'd want to discover wouldn't be necessarily unique to a single disease. They'd exist across many diseases in many different settings, it's just that they'd only work together in a certain way in one disease. But you could, rediscover, you could discover them anywhere. And so, uh, a more formal way to do this is to say, okay, I've got a whole bunch of samples and genes. What I really want to learn are patterns, so I can go to samples and patterns. <laughs> and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take those patterns to a rare disease, and I'm gonna ask, are there patterns that are significantly associated with uh, having a disease or, or not having a disease? Can you wave at the people? Can you say hi? Can you say hi? <laughs> They're all saying hi. <laughs> So, so this was her approach to sidestep the challenge. Uh, lost, okay, there's the answer. And so we worked with public data. So this is, again, genomic data. Um, it's not from dbGaP, uh, but we downloaded data from recount. So this is publicly available. Uh, you don't actually have to go through a data request. Um, and it's actually, we're probably tertiary users at this point because it's originally hosted in SRA. It was reprocessed by Jeff Leake's group at Hopkins into something called recount two, and then we're using it here. 
So I don't know how this ends up getting tracked by the National Library of Medicine, but I think this type of use is probably also really important. So maybe we can figure out a way to, to better track these types of things as well. Um, in this case, we downloaded 70,000 RNA-seq samples that Jeff Leake's group had uh, used rail to reprocess. If you just want to back of the envelope what it would have cost for us to generate these samples at Alex's, um, we guesstimate that this would have cost about $1,000 a sample, just in terms of sample handling costs. And so in total, this data set, in terms of value to us, we thought was about a $70 million data set. And you know, if you think about the scale of Alex's, that's a really valuable resource to just have at your fingertips with an internet connection. We analyzed this data set. <laughs> say hi again. Can you say hi again? Everyone says hi. Um, using something called Plier. So this is a great town to talk about Plier in, because Plier is actually published by Maria Shakina's group at Pitt, so just down the road. So if you like this story, go talk to Maria. Her work is awesome. Um, so this is when it was a preprint. It actually, oh, it just came out in Nature Methods. So I updated the slide. Um, Plier is essentially, let's just say, learning these patterns. Um, can I put you down? If I put you down, will you feel like you're hurting? Um, so Plier is essentially just learning these patterns, and it's just learning it in a way where um, it's trying to, it gets a small reward if those patterns align to processes that we care about. And it also tries to make the gene to pattern mapping sparse. So not every gene is connected to every pattern. There's sort of a subset of those, connection, uh, of those connections. And since everything in computational biology needs a name, uh, we considered multi-data set plier. We call it multiplier. And this is uh, Jacqueline's work is sort of making the connection to multiplier. Uh, so I'm gonna just give you a brief idea of sort of why we think this model works really well. So this is a series of three uh, experiments that we did trying to understand it. Uh, what I'm gonna show you here, the right box plot is a data set comprised of all the whole blood data we could find for lupus. So this is all the whole blood lupus data we could get. What we wanted was a data set where we could build the type of collection that people generally use in this type of research. Um, the left box plot is if you take recount two and you subsample recount two to be the size of the lupus data set. And the diamond on the top is if you take the entire collection of recount two. So from an experimental point of view, what we're talking about here is these two box plots are the same size data set, but the one on the right is what you'd get if you sort of do the type of analyses that people are always doing. The one you get on the left is if you just download generic data from the internet, essentially. Um, and then these two, the diamond in the box plot and the recount two column, are if you have the same type of data but very different scale. So this is, the top one is the 70,000 samples and then the bottom one is just sort of the data set that's matched to the lupus set. And so now I can walk you through what we're finding. So this is looking at uh, what we're discovering, the number of latent variables. So essentially just how many patterns are we able to pick up. Um, we're able to pick up many more patterns when we have the complete collection of data that doesn't appear to be driven by sort of the number of samples, so those are relatively similar, maybe even a little bit lower in the recount two set, but is really driven by just the scale of the data set. So that's good, more data, more patterns. This kind of makes sense from a statistical power point of view as well. So we would say, okay, we learn more total things. Um, we can also ask, because we put pathways into Plier and it gives us some fraction of them back, we can ask how many of the pathways that we told Plier about came back to us. Um, if we have these modest sized data sets here, so the lupus data set of the recount two data set, we can see about 20% of the things we told Plier about we got back. With a complete collection of data, we get about just over 40% of the things we told Plier about back. Now this still says there's 60% of the sort of pathways that we think we know about aren't coming back. So there's a few different reasons. They may not be transcriptionally regulated. Um, we may not yet have data sets that perturb those pathways. So they wouldn't, even if they are transcriptionally co-regulated, we may not see them. Um, and finally, they, they may just be, um, they may not be sort of coherent at the transcriptional level. They may have individual parts that are coherent even if the whole pathway is not coherent at the transcriptional level. So there's a few different reasons we might not find sort of the rest of the pathways. But the good news is more data and you find more sort of pre-understood knowledge coming back. That's what we're hoping for. And then finally, the question is, are we only getting more of the things we should know about or are we actually learning some new things too? And we find that we actually learn more new things as well. <laughs> Thank you. You're really bringing me some water. Um, <laughs> so, so this is asking um, what proportion of the latent variables or patterns we're getting back aligned to prior pathways. So with the SLE and recount models, you can see it's about 50% uh, of the pathways, uh, of the latent variables we got back aligned to some biological pathway we already knew about. Kind of intriguingly with the complete collection of data, it's only about 20%. So we're getting many more patterns back and not all of them are aligning to these pathways. So we might be discovering sort of 
biology that really only becomes apparent at when you have this scale of data. So that's kind of exciting. So we also learn a lot more of these unknown unknowns. So uh, just to give you the short summary of this part, uh, of actually this talk, so the machine learning analyses that reuse data from other, from other settings we find actually reach a level of detail that's otherwise impossible. And I know the question came up before about using transfer learning. Um, in, I, don't, I didn't go into the sort of how we're applying this here. Um, the disease we're looking at here, we only had three data sets with about 30 samples in each. So we didn't end up using it in a transfer learning context where you sort of take the data set, port it in, um, and then revise the model a little bit. But we did transfer the data set into the model and we get much better results sort of working with this large collection of data first and then porting that model into the rare disease data set. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's downloadable now, if you happen to have an internet connection and you wanna go above and beyond recount two, our estimate is there's about 3.8 million genome-wide assays available. Um, if you wanna think about what those would have cost to generate in the beginning, uh, that we estimate that would have been about a $3.8 billion effort to generate those data sets. So would highly recommend that if you do sort of biomedical research and you're really interested in genomics, that uh, you, you take advantage of this resource because I don't think many of us are gonna get $4 billion grants. And I think you know, being able to have that at your fingertips is just enormously valuable. Um, the Childhood Cancer Data Lab has been trying to process as much of the publicly available data as possible. And um, we've actually, there's about 1.9 million samples that are on platforms that we can process. Of those, we've been able to process one and a quarter million of them. So in the next month or so, we're gonna release large compendia with about one and a quarter million samples uniformly processed um, for people who want to take it and, and use it for downstream work. With that, I just wanna thank the people who make this possible. Um, the work that I talked about was from the Childhood Cancer Data Lab, the team there, um, Josh, Jackie, Shante, and Candace are the data science team. Um, Jackie led the multiplier project that I talked about. Um, we also have Deepa as our user experience designer who identifies the gaps, like the one where it's hard to reanalyze data sets. Um, so I didn't get to take you through the sort of how we're really putting that model to use, um, but that sort of multi-experiment comparison is exactly the type of stuff we're doing, and that's one of the things Deepa identified. And then the folks who build the infrastructure, David, Ariel, and Kurt, um, have been uh, putting the finishing touches on our system to download and uniformly process one and a quarter million samples. Um, with that, uh, I know we only have time for a couple questions, but I'll have, we'll have the panel later and be happy to take whatever questions you have. Hi. Um, so you mentioned like one of the gaps that people were finding was integrating their data or integrating other people's data together. Um, in your system, I think it's on. It sounds amplified to me, but okay. Um, did did you have to deal with? Um, was that because of batch effects? And did you have to deal with that in multiplier to make it work? Um, to make these learn these patterns across different uh, biological settings. Yeah, so that's a great question. And so we've, this isn't the first time we've sort of used this type of approach. So we've been doing this now for, um, I think we had our first paper kind of with this type of technique maybe seven or eight, seven years ago now, um, using sort of different underlying methods but the same idea. And at that point, what we found is that if you work across these large compendia of data, you don't really have to deal with these technical factors. And we always had this sort of underlying guess as to why this was. Um, and we thought it was because the biology was consistent, whereas the experiment to experiment or batch to batch noise tends to be sort of experiment specific. So if you gather enough data from enough settings, um, you actually end up, the biology ends up washing out the technical artifacts. So this was just a guess for many years. <laughs> and in the last six months, I've had a student, uh, Alex Lee, um, whose name is up here. So we'll have, I think a paper or preprint coming out pretty soon, um, where Alex has finally uh, been able to rigorously show that this is what happens. And there's, a, there's an entire world where you really, really, really have to correct for technical variation. Um, but once you get beyond a certain number of data sets, it actually hurts you to correct for the technical variation instead of just letting the biology overwhelm it. So yeah, really interesting, but <laughs> question. Thanks. Yeah, are you ready for your panel? Do you have me sit on your panel? So I think, um, Alex, in your talk, you talked about how there was a flurry of papers published in this field, and a lot of progress was, was maybe due to a lot of people um, vying for positions on a leaderboard. So potentially they had an agreed upon standard data set, 
and they could all push towards this. Do you think that in order to, to have better progress, that's a key piece is to have a, an agreed upon baseline? Because there, I don't know, there, maybe you've heard of, there was this uh, study that they looked at um, some open data that had a baseline. It was the Netflix study and, and Movie Lens, I think. And they showed that on one data set where they didn't have a leaderboard and agreed upon baseline, the baselines that people were publishing and comparing to weren't properly tuned. And uh, when someone then later went on and tuned those data set, those baselines, they showed that they could beat any of the state-of-the-art methods that were published for the next five years. Um, whereas on the other data set where um, they had a standard baseline, people were tuning and improving um, consistently. Um, so do you think that's like a necessary step to make sure that if we have open data sets, we need also agreed upon baselines and standards and sharing that as well? I think I think that's very helpful, you know, like basically both make benchmarks, experts having agree on what the right metrics are. I mean, of course, there are problems with metrics. If you have the wrong metrics and you optimize them like the impact factor, um, then you have bad consequences. But in, I think in machine learning or in biomedical research, that would be extremely useful. And I think certainly in computer vision that has been extremely useful as kind of pose estimation shows, which in itself, for example, a lot of the advances there are actually based on ImageNet, which was one of the largest data sets ever created for computer vision, um, for a long time at least. Um, and I think, yeah, so I, I kind of set out saying that computer vision is extremely, there are many com very hard computer vision problems. And what is very interesting that the moment people got very large annotated data sets and started competing on them, then many hard computer vision problems, actually solutions have been advanced tremendously. I think the example he was just highlighting too, no, like um, the we can we like data can beat everything in some sense, no. Like if you have enough data and you have good learning algorithms, then they will find interesting things beyond what we know so far. And I think that's something that is extremely important. That given that, as was highlighted in the introduction, that the amount of data we are collecting, storing. Uh, it's just tremendously growing. I think it's actually also just awesome in some sense that we have the machine learning tools to kind of tackle this data and that this data is becoming uh, available and therefore I think we will actually make interesting insights. But I, just to get back to this, yeah, I think we should have benchmarks. Uh, I would just also add to that um, more generally. So last year at the National Library of Medicine, we hosted a workshop on um, data science drivers. So basically bringing data scientists in who don't normally work on biomedical data and talking to them about what informs your decisions about what spaces to work in, what makes a data set interesting and compelling to you. Um, and that was one of the, the big things that they talked about was um, you know, certain documentation for data that we wouldn't normally think of having um, for biomedical data. So to the extent that we can have things like benchmarks um, and, and other sorts of things like that, we could potentially induce people who wouldn't normally work in this space to actually bring some other expertise. So thank you all. I think these were just fantastic examples, right, of open data and open code enabling other scientists and uh, Lisa, you talked about in your <clears throat> study how often it's off the shelf use, not on the same topic. And so my question is, a couple of years ago, New England Journal of Medicine had a famous editorial about data parasites, that if you're reusing other people's data, you're a parasite if you don't make them co-authors on your paper. And of course, with everything you just talked about, Lisa, that's impossible, right? Uh, you either share data, enable others or not. Um, Casey had started an award for data parasites, I think, in support of the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. How much progress have we made in these few years and over the last 10 years? How far are we away from completely eradicating that attitude that you're either co-author and you get in touch with me or I'm not giving you my data? So I can start. Um, I think that we do need to develop incentive structures. That's a big piece. Um, you know, we can have policies that require you to do things, but I think an important thing is how do we correctly and appropriately reward people? Co-authorship, I don't think, is the right way. Um, so I think the, the movement towards creating some of that infrastructure for data citation to enable tracking um, and also 
just you know letting people know how to properly do it. Um, I did another study looking at data citation in papers and it was really all over the place. Almost none of the, the papers actually like had a formal data citation. They mentioned it in the methods and the, you know, wherever. Um, so, so putting some of that into place I think is important. Um, and then having institutions also recognize and reward that. Yeah, just very briefly, I agree. Like I think just having different types of citations would actually be very interesting though. Like in some sense it's different to have a citation in the intro of like a general phenomenon or this data was used in that study or this algorithm was used in that study. And I think it would be good if, if kind of metrics could reflect this. If, if you could have not a one dimensional citation metric, but like 10 dimensional data citation metric and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the incentives are key. Um, I, I think you may have, I know you just gave a talk at Alex's Innovation Summit. I can't remember. Um, I think actually the talk happened before uh, you were there, but um, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation has changed uh, their grant making process. So now the resources that get generated under the grant is a, you know, a key document like it is at the NIH. But unlike most NIH grant mechanisms, it actually counts for impact. So if you have a better sharing plan, your grant is more likely to get funded. And that sharing plan includes both future behavior, so what you plan to do under this grant, as well as past behavior. So like, you know, how, how well can you describe your sharing in the past? particularly compelling cases of reuse where you, and it explicitly asks, will you not be, a, like where you were not a co-author on the papers. Um, and so that type of thing, you know, the hope is to really change the culture in, you know, it's a localized field, so it's pediatric cancer research, but to make it much more focused on a broad sharing as opposed to like, what's really common is clique sharing, where you have sort of a small group of people that all share with each other with this sort of co-authorship network. But very, those are very hard to break into and we think I personally think, I guess I should say not uh, speaking on behalf of Alex as a whole, um, but at least I personally think that those uh, limit and slow the progress of science. So. Hi, uh, thank you very much you all for the talks. Um, so I have a question for everybody really in general, but. Um, so uh, recently, I, I've been more and more involved into discussions on how open science and uh, open scholarship um, policy advancements are also like um, new uh, kind of uh, ideas that are proposed, implemented, uh, can actually sometimes harm um, in terms of like um, harm like uh, researchers who are not as resourced. Um, and so for open data, it was brought up um, uh, from a researcher in Ghana that I'm collaborating with, the actual example of how he, like the, the main advantage that he, his laboratory has over the same um, project that is done at Harvard is that he has actually a lot of data uh, regarding like malaria patients in, in Ghana. And so he, when we were talking about like open science, open data, he was like, you know, I'm, I'm really skeptical about um, and afraid of putting actually my data out there because our lab is three people. And if I put my lab, out, my data out there, a lab with 34 postdocs uh, can really very quickly do it. And these are labs that are also funded by NIH uh, through the H3 uh, BioNet project in Africa. And so I'm wondering like if there is any um, discussions involved or plan to try to also mitigate some, I don't know at a policy level, but like some of these potential harm that actually can come out of new open science solutions that, uh, because I don't think that just putting a policy out there, I'm not saying this is what you're doing, uh, without ac thinking into account these concerns might actually work. Um, I don't have answers, <laughs> uh, but I would say, you know, I, I think that concern, um, when, it, when it comes to concerns around open science, I think that's the one I find most compelling. Um, not necessarily that um, there is a lab that has collected a huge amount of data, but particularly when those labs are in places where they would have sort of unequal access to resources and where m they might lose competitiveness um, if they shared. So I think uh, as, on the funding side, uh, changing incentives to provide funding that enhances sharing I think is important. Now if a lab is in another country, I mean, that is funded by the NIH, but you could imagine also labs that aren't NIH funded you know, might not be in a place to benefit from that. And so might, there might be more um, challenges there. So I, I, I don't have any answers, but I would say I think that is one of the things that also I find important and troubling. 
Um, so I think that would be a great thing to submit to the public comment period, <laughs> to the policy. Um, but yeah, I, that I, I think that the policy recognizes that there's not really like a one size fits all approach to sharing that um, we would like data to be as open as possible, but um, you know, recognize that there's definitely some complicated issues with this. And I, I, I don't have a good answer either, but um, I think that that is something that NIH policymakers are cognizant of. Yeah, so this, this maybe is a question for, for the uh, rest of the day too, but I'm curious about how, uh, how you accommodate the challenge of new data types and, and sort of layers of organization. And I'm I guess this is, this is both an NIH question, but also uh, maybe, maybe to, to to everybody, when you have a new data type that you know interfaces with the, with the set that you are working with, where do we begin? And I'm speaking now from primarily, I'm primarily an empiricist that, that hacks a bit with open data when need be, but I find that this adaptation is particularly challenging. So I'm not totally sure I understand your question, but I think part of the answer is um, standards, so um, creating and, oh, go ahead. If the standards don't exist. <laughs> um, so I think that that requires community effort to develop a standard. Um, and I think that there are often cases where that can happen by extending existing standards or um, modifying existing standards. One of the things that we're also working on at the NLM is developing like um, like a core set of minimal metadata that would enable us to search across multiple different repositories. So we have, you know, there are different ways that um, researchers in different fields and working with different data types go about discovering data. So it's really tricky to try and get all of those things together in a way that we could meaningfully search across multiple data sets. So that is a challenge that we've um, tried to take on. And so I think starting there and thinking about like how maybe the data that you're working with might interface with other types of data could be potentially useful. Hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Um, I guess, I, I think I'm guessing you're asking around where do you put those data? How do you publish on those data? Um, you know, I think now there are some really excellent general purpose repositories. Um, so for instance, from the multiplier model, um, we put that in Figshare. Um, the two that we generally use are Figshare and Zenodo. And in, this, in, in the case of this model, the way the file size and everything worked, it was just easier to put it in Figshare. Um, I would use that as sort of your first place like host of data if there is no other good repository because at least then it's preserved and hopefully you put some description of what those data files are and sort of uh, what's in there. Um, you know, I would hope that as these data types become more widely used, there would become sort of a government-funded single point of truth repository where, you know, hopefully one uh, either, you know, if there was a set of things on Figshare that had been very valuable, they could get ported into that repository, hopefully. But then once those repositories exist, so for instance, if you're generating gene expression data um, with, say, RNA-seq, I would hope you would put that in SRA instead of, like, you know, uploading it to some generic repository because there's a lot more that people can do with it when it goes into these sort of well-designed uh, repositories. And then, um, yeah, I think figuring out where that ecosystem kind of starts to break down at the end is also probably important. So what do you do with, a, with data like microarray data, right, which is still occasionally being generated, but, but less so. Um, you know, I think in the case of array data, we might be doing okay because um, it's actually not that much data, and so it's not that expensive to keep storing it. But you know, as we sort of move from sequencing types that are maybe becoming less and less uh, widely used, then I think the question's really gonna come up of do we really keep archiving all of this? And I don't know. I took you from the beginning to the middle, which hopefully gets you partway through it. So, So I would add to that also, and thank you for, for bringing that up. So NIH is interested in and in currently looking at 
um, figuring out what is the space of generalist repositories in the biomedical um, research data ecosystem. So we do have quite a lot of um, pretty specific, subject-specific repositories that NIH funds or works with. Um, but we are, you know, we do recognize that, yeah, not everything fits within one of these. So what is the, the best way to do that? And again, I think that work that we're doing on developing um, a, a common metadata model hopefully will alleviate some of the issues that people have in thinking about where to put stuff because ideally it wouldn't really matter where you put something. Like I shouldn't have to know where the data is to be able to find it, right? Um, just in the same way that I shouldn't have to know what journal an article is in for me to find it. We have PubMed, we don't have to worry about that. So um, the next step for us I think is like, how do we think about developing something like a PubMed for data where it doesn't matter where you put it, you'll still be able to find it. My question is um, the way it seems like the data scientists in the medical field collaborate because my background is in engineering and we would meet with like competitors at Uber, Argo AI, would come together and talk about issues. But then um, through my wife who works at Pitt, I would be talking to data scientists at the immunology lab and then I would talk to another friend who's a data scientist in the dental school and they don't know each other and they talk, don't talk to each other. And I'm like, you guys are dealing with similar problems. I'm just trying, I'm just curious, um, what's the gen general trends in the col collaboration in the medical field? And I have an engineering firm, so I'm not too familiar with it. Um, so one thing I'll say that again came out of that workshop that uh, we held at NLM was that part of um, what maybe is some of the hesitance among data scientists to collaborate with biomedical researchers is that they don't wanna be seen as like providing a service, they wanna be seen as co-equal collaborators. So um, I think not, this doesn't totally answer your question about um, conversation among different labs, but teaching biomedical researchers how to meaningfully work with data scientists in ways that they are again co-equal collaborators and they're not seeing them as like a technician in the lab. Um, so I think part of that is teaching people the language to speak across disciplines, um, which is a tricky thing to do. Um, and then, I mean, just in terms of the silos, that is, I think, always gonna be an issue, and that's, I don't know that I necessarily have a good answer for that, um, but maybe one of you two does. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I would say I don't have an answer on uh, the silos necessarily, except that sort of hosting interdisciplinary events and getting people into the room at the same time is probably helpful. Um, you know, I think the service, there's a, a certain model in biomedical research that I think uh, became very entrenched with biostatisticians over a reasonably lengthy period of time, um, where to get your grant funded, you had to have bi a biostatistician on that grant, but you know you needed them for some percent of time, but not that much time. So people got spread across a huge number of projects in these types of service roles often. And um, in computational biology and data science, um, you know that often uh, folks may be seen as similar to that model and um, I think it's bad for the field when that happens but um, yeah I think that's probably fi fixing that is also really important and fixing those perceptions is really important um, I can't tell you how many times uh, someone has come to me and said hey I, I can give you five percent effort on this R01 if you'll just solve this quick and easy problem and you know, you look at the problem, and you're like, "Well, that's at least two R ones worth of you know computational effort just to figure out if that's a solvable problem." So, like, <laughs> um, so I think figuring out how to fix that culture is probably important to getting more kind of buy-in across disciplines as well in terms of communicating about the problems and solutions. Yeah, so the question was, uh, is the grant structure and incentive structure uh, potentially causing the siloing? Um, I, I, it would be a potential hypothesis I don't think I could discount, let's put it that way. I don't <laughs> yeah, I think that question about incentives is an interesting one. That was another thing that came up in this workshop again, um, was that when you're talking about data scientists, the places that they want to publish or the things that are meaningful for them to move forward in their career are really different from what a biomedical researcher has. So that's a tricky, um, you know, 
uh, question to think about when you're starting a collaboration is like, what is a meaningful outcome for everyone involved? I guess, like, um, from the post postdoc perspective, in some sense, I think one argument is always, I mean, first author papers are the most important thing, so people focus on their main project, which, of course, for the bigger good, I think, is suboptimal, but yeah, it's just how it is. Yeah, and I guess if we're going to do one more contrast with industry, um, you know, many of the problems that data scientists are working on in, on in industry, um, those have your did this work or not and your payoff is, you know, six months to a year away maybe. Um, in biomedicine, you know, I think the, there was a paper in PNAS not too long ago which says, you know, basic science discovery through drug that improve, like translational improvement in people's lives is 17 years. And so I think the lag and sort of that really long feedback window may also lead to some of this difficulty in aligning incentives. this point. Yeah. Find them again during the breaks and lunch and uh, keep the discussion going. Um, we'll take a break now, drink some coffee. We'll start back at 10 of. Uh,